The federal government alone spends four and a half billion dollars a year locking up people for drug offenses. It costs almost twenty-eight thousand dollars a year just to incarcerate one prisoner. Compare that to the average annual tuition at a four-year public college, which is five thousand four hundred ninety-one dollars, and you realize that the drug war is blurring our nation's priorities. Taxpayers' money would be much better spent educating people instead of punishing them. But thanks to ever-increasing mandatory minimum drug sentences, an entire class of young people are being filtered into new supermax prisons, while the resulting budget crunch forces the rest of us to go to old, dilapidated schools. The more money we dump into prisons, the less we have to invest in college campuses. Visit www.schoolsnotprisons.com to find out how you can get involved in the war against the war on drugs. Um, I would trade marijuana for alcohol in a heartbeat. Um, I know from the point of view of violence, which we've been talking about, I've been to hundreds of calls for domestic violence uh, and almost a hundred percent of them either the offender or the victim or both are drinking or drunk. I cannot recall a single episode of domestic violence I went to as a police officer where yeah he smoked some dope and beat the shit out of me. <laughs> Just doesn't happen. Why is that? It's interesting to speculate about that. It's not a difference in pharmacology. It's the way we've been socialized to behave when we use certain drugs. Uh, and we've been socialized. People say marijuana is not a violent drug. It doesn't, there's not a gene in marijuana that says violence or not violence. It's an inert substance. But we've learned how to behave in certain ways. And most of you all have had this experience. You know, you're sitting at a party and here it comes and you know how am I going to behave and, and you're watching other people to see how they act aren't you and here it comes here here finally it comes to you and what do people do take a big hit pass it on man that's great stuff where's the Fritos yes. you know, that's not pharmacology that's the way we learn to act so the way we've learned to act with alcohol is guys get violent do, do women get violent some of them do but Women act much differently with alcohol than men do. It's not a result of physiologic differences. It's a result of social learning. Okay? So, I'll take marijuana uh, in a heartbeat over <coughs> alcohol. All right. Let's talk about the rest of this drug market. Who are the customers? Let's take out marijuana customers. And who are the customers that are left in this illegal drug market? 90%, a couple statistics here, 90% of the drug problems in this country come from heroin, crack cocaine, and methamphetamine, okay? While marijuana is the biggest product, it's the smallest proportion of the drug problems that we suffer. Here's what we're suffering from, okay? Who are the people who are in the drug market buying this stuff day after day after day, 24-7? Yes, sir? Uh, I'll say heroin is mostly white people, crack is black, and okay. that is mostly white people. I wasn't thinking particularly of race, oh, but sorry. we're talking about uh, who, who are the people who do this? How would we describe them? Uh, people like, come from like, that stuff, they have any backgrounds, they're well, addicted. All that, yeah, you, you have, they're addicted. We're talking about addicts, people who are there buying 24-7. If you're a dealer on a street corner, whether you're black, white, or purple, who are your best customers, whether they're black, <coughs> white, or purple? You're looking for addicts. They're the people that are coming there on a regular basis to buy from you, okay? If we take addicts out of the equation, what kind of business is left in the illegal market? Nothing. I mean, basically nothing. Yes, sir. Um, I was just going to comment that uh, for all three of those drugs, it's usually involved in prostitution and other things to do with that. You know, that's a great point. I volunteer for, we started a program when I was advice as part of the planning committee for the Off the Streets program, which attempts to take women involved in prostitution and get them off the street. So 
and, and I continued to work with those women as a volunteer once I retired. And I can tell you, 100% of those women were drug addicted. Not 99%, 90%, 85%, of them had an addiction problem. Okay? To my friend back here's point, I went to a lot of community meetings in Cincinnati, and one of the, the you know, the major complaint is always drug dealer in our community. And the point he makes, which is to look at the race of this stuff, is, you know, what happens is we get these caravans of folks coming from Indiana, Kentucky, and the suburbs, coming into over the Rhine, coming into Madisonville, coming into Mill, uh, Millvale, who are buying drugs. And, you know, we'd set up stings where we'd take our mice officers, dress them as dealers, and when people came to buy drugs, we'd sell them some crap, some fleece, and then we'd bust them. And universally, it's addicts. And I remember one guy, this guy's 63 years old, and he's got his 84-year-old mother in the back seat, down and over the Rhine buying drugs. Tell me that's normal behavior? I mean, that's addiction, okay? So, how do we get addicts out of the market? What do we do with them? Rehab. Rehab, yeah. Portugal is a country that addressed this head on in the late 90s. And one of the things they did was they decriminalized all possession offenses. And the whole emphasis of the system they've set up is to force people into treatment. Federal government estimates that about 10% of American addicts get treatment. In Portugal, following the changes that they made, the number of addicts in treatment increased by four. 400 percent. If we, if we can get 40 percent to 50 percent of our addicted population into treatment, what happens to the illegal market? It, it shrinks. It withers and goes away. Okay? And with the loss of that money, you know, all these <coughs> guns, all this stuff disappears. I'm, believe me, I'm one of the least naive people in this room. And I'm talking to a cop friend of mine, and he says, you know, what, what are these guys going to do? You know, when, if the drug trafficking, we're talking about marijuana legalization. There's a lot of people making money on this stuff. What, <coughs> what's going to happen? And I'm thinking, internationally, yeah, these Mexican cartels, do you think they're just going to pack up and, awesome. and, and become, awesome. yeah, get in some other business? If they were getting some other business, it's going to be human trafficking, it's going to be extortion, it's going to be identity theft and fraud. Okay, now we move on to deal with that, but drugs is where the big money is. That's why they're in there. Okay, so that, if we take that away from them in the short run, you know, we're not going to rehab everybody in the world, but in the long run, I, I guarantee you we'll have some impact. I got 40 years of experience working in this stuff that tells me that's going to work. Yes, sir. Just to contrast what the showman here had to say about the, the types of people, isn't it true that addicts are across all social economic spectrums? Addicts and drug use crosses economic, racial, every spectrum in the country. I've yeah. heard it said that there's Tomorrow. many addicts or drug use in Indian Hills as they're in, as in Western Hills. I'm guessing that's probably close to true. I mean, why wouldn't it be? There may be you know, money insulation from problems. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if you don't have the money to protect you, you're going to get caught up in some other stuff. Hang on a second. Yes, sir. Well, in the movie Traffic, there was actually a girl uh, from Indian Hill who yeah. was, I think, the free base cocaine. So yeah. yeah, that's a good movie. Yes, sir. Oh, why don't you uh, hear about like? I mean, I know there is. Big drug problem in like the suburbs, like Indian Hill and like Mason. How come you don't hear about that stuff as much as you hear about the low party? Well, now you're asking me a question I didn't have the answer to. That's, that's yes, sir. Yeah. I think good lawyers, like you said, the money insulates you from problems, and yeah. cops aren't out in Indian Hill looking to bust people for drugs. They're looking to bust them on the street corners downtown. Well, and they're not selling on the street corners in Indian Hill. You're, you're 
you're putting yourself at risk when you go out at 14 and Walnut and stand there all day doing this. <coughs> Nobody ignores that. And arresting guys on the corner selling drugs is shooting fish in a barrel. There's no challenge to it, believe me. Very dangerous, but if we, we can go out and do it till the cows come home and, and we don't solve anything. Yes, sir. Ma'am. So, um, what are the biggest opposition I've seen um, with sort of going to rehabilitation and legalization of marijuana and things like that, that's law enforcement, is that there is, I mean, you've been in law enforcement for a while, so, um, and it seems that budget cuts for police officers are constantly being cut, there's constantly jobs being taken away. Do you think there's a lot of opposition from law enforcement for legalization because they're afraid of losing their jobs because of the amount? of money that marijuana brings in from the law enforcement. Um, just because I, I figure if it's if marijuana is 60 of the drug cartel's money, then it must be a huge part of law enforcement. And I always think about it like if there's, you know, you're one police officer, but I, I guess they want to know sort of what other police officers are thinking about the drug problem. And if there's more towards legalization or they're afraid of that because they're afraid of budget cuts. I can tell you that LEAP, uh, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, that Todd mentioned is made, uh, we've got a membership of 35,000 people uh, that includes several thousand active and retired police officers, prosecutors, judges, uh, and just as a plug, that's an organization anybody can join. My friend back here has got some brochures which he'll pass around that uh, you know, tell you how to join and how you can support LEAP. There's no charge to be a member, uh, and they do awful good work. There's really good people involved. Are, are cops scared of legalization? I don't think so. Um, you know, do, do cops make money off of drugs? You know, there's the asset forfeiture business, but that doesn't provide anywhere near what a lot of people seem to believe it does. And that money is also earmarked for a variety of things, and that's divvied up long before the cops ever get it. And I'm saying that for here. There's some jurisdictions where that's different, and cops are sort of direct beneficiaries of it, and that may change the financial incentives. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of police officers that are going to stand up and say, I think drugs should be legalized, because there's a strong prohibition in policing against getting involved in any kind of politics, so they're not going to stay at speaking to them privately. And you know, we've had these conversations for years. My guessing is 40 to 50 percent are going to say, "Yeah, we're wasting our time. Yeah, we got to do it." Yes, sir. Yeah, right now in the news and in, in uh, Border Patrol in El Paso, right. they're firing one of the officers because he mentioned we might straighten out this problem by legalizing it. And they're firing important. The ACLU's taking up the case now. Yeah. And I think it comes from the top down. Well, telling them it, you know. Yeah. Here's everybody familiar with Proposition 19 in California last fall? Mm -hmm. A couple things leading up to that. One is the federal government, last about a year ago now, basically punted on medical marijuana. They sent out an advisory, Eric Holder, the Attorney General sent out an advisory saying that the federal government would not prosecute any citizens for violating federal law where they were in compliance with state law. In other words, they weren't going to come down on people who were the, in the medical marijuana states. Uh, Proposition 19 in California on the ballot this past fall called for full legalization in California. Two weeks before that election, the Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, said if that passes, the federal government will prosecute Californians who violate federal law. Very disappointing to me. I mean, um, it, it's federal arrogance that, that should never have got there. If Californians vote to legalize marijuana, God bless them and on with them. Isn't that freedom of choice in America? And for the Attorney General of the United States to say they're going to prosecute them federally because they don't have the policy is way out of line. Um, shouldn't have happened. But guess who was the other big supporter against legalization? Who poured in all the money at the last minute? Budweiser? Yeah, yeah. beer, 
distributors, beer manufacturers, they've got a very, very realistic sense of this. And I was in a, a conference in Kentucky with state legislators and talking to a guy from Kentucky, and he was talking about every year in his district they try to basically go from dry to wet, legalize alcohol in the county. And he says, the big groups that always come out against it are who? Bad. Bootleggers and the churches. And I guarantee you, as this starts getting closer and more and more states start voting like this, you're going to see the cartels getting into some serious lobbying to try to keep drugs illegal. I mean, the money is just incredible and they're benefiting from it and we, all the rest of us are suffering from it. Yes, sir. Being a man of law, I would imagine that you know the penalties and all that for uh, being locked up and being prosecuted for having uh, marijuana and drugs of that sort. Um, how do you feel that the government would react to um, legalizing marijuana and then having to admit to locking up everyone for marijuana and law? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. You know, people change, times go by, and, and we're doing and saying things today that 30 years ago, which just would have been considered, I mean, for, for the older of us in this room, I mean, pornography used to be something that the vice squad was in. I mean, we busted Hustler, we busted the uh, stores downtown that were selling pornographic magazines, and now you turn on your TV and get the same crap, so <laughs> times change. Um, here's the deal. Um, what would, what would you think would be the FBI's stance toward people that want to become FBI agents and admit they'd smoked marijuana? Do you think they're allowed in the process, eliminated? Actually, the FBI policy is that if you haven't used marijuana in three years, you're a candidate to become an agent. And I was in charge of recruiting in Cincinnati, and we had pretty much the same policy. We used to always, and one of the questions we always ask is, have you used illegal drugs? And when's the last time you used illegal drugs? And if somebody looks at their watch, it's not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> but if, you know, so three years, you can become an FBI agent. What this means to me is that if you get busted on a marijuana offense, it's extremely likely that the police officer, the prosecutor, and the judge all involved in the case have basically committed the same behavior. Is that fair? It's not. Sir? You said, so are you saying like, because <clears throat> I was talking to a guy, so I was interested in the, in the CIA, and he told me that, like, he didn't tell me that, he just told me that, he didn't say it outright, but he said that if you ever, like, smoke, like, marijuana, or, like, have, like, alcohol, like, under your skin, say you're, like, dang it, from, like, CIA, or something, from the CIA, or something like that. I mean, you're trying to scare me, but, uh, that, that may be a CIA policy. All, all I can FBI. speak to is the FBI. Oh. Yeah. Why is it like that? Right. I haven't got a clue. I'm, I'm not sure what the CIA's policy is, but if you look on their website, there'll be an employment link, yeah. and it'll be spelled out. So don't don't listen to what somebody says. You can check for yourself. Sir? Uh, you mentioned that leap. Um, it's not just retired police officers, but current ones as well, right? right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I thought, like, most police departments, like, require um, you to kind of like not talk about, you know, your opinions on such things, such matters as that, because they feel it's bad for like the reputation of the department or something, and yeah. that you can like lose your like job and stuff like that. Is that how it is most of the time? You, you can be a member, but they would, they would probably frown on you speaking out publicly, particularly